A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain. Chapter Twenty Four. A Rival Magician. My influence in the Valley of Holiness was something prodigious. Now, it seemed worth while to try to turn it to some valuable account. The thought came to me the next morning, and was suggested by my seeing one of my knights who was in the soap line come riding in. According to history, the monks of this place two centuries before had been worldly-minded enough to want to wash. It might be that there was a leaven of this unrighteousness still remaining. So I sounded a brother. "'Wouldn't you like a bath?' He shuddered at the thought, the thought of the peril of it to the well, but he said with feeling, one needs not to ask that of a poor body who has not known that blessed refreshment sith that he was a boy would god i might wash me but it may not be fair sir tempt me not it is forbidden and then he sighed in such a sorrowful way that i was resolved he should have at least one layer of his real estate removed if it sized up my whole influence and bankrupted the pile so i went to the abbot and asked for a permit for this brother he blenched at the idea i don't mean that you could see him blench for of course you couldn't see it without you scraped him and i didn't care enough about it to scrape him but i knew the blench was there just the same and within a book's cover's thickness of the surface too blenched and trembled he said ah son ask aught else thou wilt and it is thine and freely granted out of a grateful heart but this oh this would you drive away the blessed water again no father i will not drive it away i have mysterious knowledge which teaches me that there was an error that other time when it was thought the institution of the bath banished the fountain a large interest began to show up in the old man's face my knowledge informs me that the bath was innocent of that misfortune which was caused by quite another sort of sin these are brave words but uh, but right welcome if they be true oh, they are true indeed let me build the bath again father let me build it again and the fountain shall flow for ever you promise this you promise this say the word say you promise it i do promise it then will i have the first bath myself go get ye to your work tarry not tarry not but go i and my boys were at work straight off the ruins of the old bath were there yet in the basement of the monastery not a stone missing they had been left just so all these lifetimes and avoided with a pious fear as things accursed in two days we had it all done and the water in a spacious pool of clear pure water that a body could swim in it was running water too it came in and went out through the ancient pipes the old abbot kept his word and was the first to try it he went down black and shaky leaving the whole black community above troubled and worried and full of bodings but he came back white and joyful and the game was made another triumph scored it was a good campaign that we made in that valley of holiness, and I was very well satisfied and ready to move on now, but I struck a disappointment. I caught a heavy cold, and it started up an old lurking rheumatism of mine. Of course the rheumatism hunted up my weakest place and located itself there. This was the place where the abbot put his arms about me and mashed me, what time he was moved to testify his gratitude to me with an embrace. When at last I got out, I was a shadow. But everybody was full of attentions and kindnesses, and these brought cheer back into my life, and were the right medicine to help a convalescent swiftly up toward health and strength again. So I gained fast. Sandy was worn out with nursing, so I made up my mind to turn out and go a cruise alone, leaving her at the nunnery to rest up. My idea was to disguise myself as a free man of peasant degree and wander through the country a week or two on foot. This would give me a chance to eat and lodge with the lowliest and poorest class of free citizens on equal terms. There was no other way to inform myself perfectly of their everyday life and the operation of the laws upon it. If I went among them as a gentleman, there would be restraints and conventionalities which would shut me out from their private joys and troubles and I would get no further than the outside shell. 
one morning i was out on a long walk to get up muscle for my trip and had climbed the ridge which bordered the northern extremity of the valley when i came upon an artificial opening in the face of a low precipice and recognized it by its location as a hermitage which had often been pointed out to me from a distance as the den of a hermit of high renown for dirt and austerity i knew he had lately been offered a situation in the great sahara where lions and sand-flies made the hermit life peculiarly attractive and difficult and had gone to africa to take possession so i thought i would look in and see how the atmosphere of this den agreed with its reputation my surprise was great the place was newly swept and scoured then there was another surprise back in the gloom of the cavern i heard the clink of a little bell and then this exclamation hello central is this you camelot behold thou mayst glad thy heart and thou hast faith to believe the wonderful when that it cometh in an unexpected guise and maketh itself manifest in impossible places here standeth in the flesh his mightiness the boss and with thine own ears shall ye hear him speak now what a radical reversal of things this was what a jumbling together of extravagant incongruities what a fantastic conjunction of opposites and irreconcilables the home of the bogus miracle become the home of a real one the den of a medieval hermit turned into a telephone office the telephone clerk stepped into the light and i recognized one of my young fellows i said how long has this office been established here ulfius but since midnight fair sir boss and it please you we saw many lights in the valley and so judged it well to make a station for that where so many lights be needs must they indicate a town of goodly size quite right it isn't a town in the customary sense but it's a good stand anyway do you know where you are of that i have had no time to make inquiry for when as my comradeship moved hence upon their labors leaving me in charge i got me to needed rest proposing to inquire when i waked and report the place's name to camelot for record well this is the valley of holiness it didn't take i mean he didn't start at the name as i had supposed he would he merely said i will so report it why the surrounding regions are filled with the noise of late wonders that have happened here you didn't hear of them ah ye will remember we move by night and avoid speech withal we learn naught but that we get by the telephone from camelot why they know all about this thing haven't they told you anything about the great miracle of the restoration of a holy fountain oh that indeed yes but the name of this valley doth woundily differ from the name of that one indeed to differ wider were not pos what was the name then the valley of hellishness that explains it confound a telephone anyway it is the very demon for conveying similarities of sound that are miracles of divergence from similarity of sense but no matter you know the name of the place now call up camelot he did it and had clarence sent for it was good to hear my boy's voice again it was like being home after some affectionate interchanges and some account of my late illness i said what is new the king and queen and many of the court do start even in this hour to go to your valley to pay pious homage to the waters ye have restored and cleanse themselves of sin and see the place where the infernal spirit spouted true hell flames to the clouds and ye listen sharply ye may hear me wink and hear me likewise smile a smile since twas i that made selection of those flames from out of our stock and sent them by your order does the king know the way to this place the king no nor to any other in his realms mayhap but the lads that holp you with your miracle will be his guide and lead the way and appoint the places for rests at noons and sleeps at night this will bring them here when mid-afternoon or later the third day anything else in the way of news uh, the king hath begun the raising of the standing army he suggested to him one regiment is complete and officered the mischief i wanted a main hand in that myself there is only one body of men in the kingdom that are fitted to officer a regular army yes and now you will marvel to know there's not so much as one west pointer in that regiment what are you talking about are you in earnest it is truly as i have said why this is making me uneasy 
who were chosen and what was the method competitive examination indeed i know not of the method i but know this these officers be all of noble family and are born uh, what is it you call it uh, chuckleheads there's something wrong clarence comfort yourself then for two candidates for lieutenancy do travel hence with the king young nobles both and if you but wait where you are you will hear them questioned that is news to the purpose i will get one west pointer in anyway mount a man and send him to that school with a message let him kill horses if necessary but he must be there before sunset to-night and say there is no need i have laid a ground wire to the school prithee let me connect you with it, it sounded good in this atmosphere of telephones and lightning communication with distant regions i was breathing the breath of life again after long suffocation i realized then what a creepy dull inanimate horror this land had been to me all these years and how i had been in such a stifled condition of mind as to have grown used to it almost beyond the power to notice it i gave my order to the superintendent of the academy personally i also asked him to bring me some paper and a fountain pen and a box or so of safety matches i was getting tired of doing without these conveniences i could have them now as i wasn't going to wear armor any more at present and therefore could get at my pockets when i got back to the monastery i found a thing of interest going on the abbot and his monks were assembled in the great hall observing with childish wonder and faith the performances of a new magician a fresh arrival his dress was the extreme of the fantastic as showy and foolish as the sort of thing an indian medicine man wears he was mowing and mumbling and gesticulating and drawing mystical figures in the air and on the floor the regular thing you know he was a celebrity from asia so he said and that was enough that sort of evidence was as good as gold and passed current everywhere how easy and cheap it was to be a great magician on this fellow's terms his specialty was to tell you what any individual on the face of the globe was doing at the moment and what he had done at any time in the past and what he would do at any time in the future he asked if any would like to know what the emperor of the east was doing now the sparkling eyes and the delighted rubbing of hands made eloquent answer this reverend crowd would like to know what that monarch was at just at this moment the fraud went through some more mummery and then made grave announcement the high and mighty emperor of the east doth at this moment put money in the palm of a holy begging friar one two three pieces and they be all of silver a buzz of admiring exclamations broke out all around it is marvellous wonderful what study what labor to have acquired a so amazing power as this would they like to know what the supreme lord of ind was doing yes he told them what the supreme lord of ind was doing then he told them what the sultan of egypt was at also what the king of the remote seas was about and so on and so on and with each new marvel the astonishment at his accuracy rose higher and higher they thought he must surely strike an uncertain place some time but no he never had to hesitate he always knew and always with unerring precision I saw that if this thing went on i should lose my supremacy this fellow would capture my following i should be left out in the cold i must put a cog in his wheel and do it right away too i said if i may ask i should very greatly like to know what a certain person is doing speak and freely i will tell you it will be difficult perhaps impossible my art knows not the word the more difficult it is the more certainly will i reveal it to you you see i was working up the interest it was getting pretty high too you could see that by the craning necks all around and the half suspended breathing so now i climaxed it if you make no mistake if you tell me truly what i want to know i will give you two hundred silver pennies the fortune is mine i will tell you what you would know then tell me what i am doing with my right hand ah there was a general gasp of surprise it had not occurred to anybody in the crowd that simple trick of inquiring about somebody who wasn't ten thousand miles away the magician was hit hard it was an emergency that had never happened in his experience before and it corked him he didn't know how to meet it he looked stunned confused he couldn't say a word come i said what are you waiting for 
is it possible you can answer up right off and tell what anybody on the other side of the earth is doing and yet can't tell what a person is doing who isn't three yards from you persons behind me know what i am doing with my right hand they will endorse you if you tell correctly he was still dumb very well i'll tell you why you don't speak up and tell it is because you don't know you a magician good friends this tramp is a mere fraud and liar this distressed the monks and terrified them they were not used to hearing these awful beings called names and they did not know what might be the consequence there was a dead silence now superstitious bodings were in every mind the magician began to pull his wits together and when he presently smiled an easy nonchalant smile it spread a mighty relief around for it indicated that his mood was not destructive he said it hath struck me speechless the frivolity of this person's speech let all know if perchance there be any who know it not that enchanters of my degree deign not to concern themselves with the doings of any but kings princes emperors them that be born in the purple and them only had ye asked me what arthur the great king is doing it were another matter and i had told ye but the doings of a subject interest me not oh i misunderstood you i thought you said anybody and so i supposed anybody included well anybody that is everybody it doth anybody that is of lofty birth and the better if he be royal that it beseemeth might be well said the abbot who saw his opportunity to smooth things and avert disaster for it were not likely that so wonderful a gift as this would be conferred for the revelation of the concerns of lesser beings than such as be born near to the summits of greatness our arthur the king would you know of him broke in the enchanter most gladly yea and gratefully everybody was full of awe and interest again right away the incorrigible idiots they watched the incantations absorbingly and looked at me with a there now what can you say to that air when the announcement came the king is weary with the chase and lieth in his palace these two hours sleeping a dreamless sleep god's benison upon him said the abbot and crossed himself may that sleep be to the refreshment of his body and his soul and so it might be if he were sleeping i said but the king is not sleeping the king rides here was trouble again a conflict of authority nobody knew which of us to believe i still had some reputation left the magician's scorn was stirred and he said lo i have seen many wonderful soothsayers and prophets and magicians in my life days but none before that could sit idle and see to the heart of things with never an incantation to help you have lived in the woods and lost much by it i use incantations myself as this good brotherhood are aware but only on occasions of moment when it comes to sarcasming i reckon i know how to keep my end up that jab made this fellow squirm the abbot inquired after the queen and the court and got this information they be all on sleep being overcome by fatigue like as to the king i said that is merely another lie half of them are about their amusements the queen and the other half are not sleeping they ride now perhaps you can spread yourself a little and tell us where the king and queen and all that are this moment riding with them are going they sleep now as i said but on the morrow they will ride for they go a journey toward the sea and where will they be the day after to-morrow at vespers far to the north of camelot and half their journey will be done that is another lie by the space of a hundred and fifty miles their journey will not be merely half done it will be all done and they will be here in this valley that was a noble shot it set the abbot and the monks in a whirl of excitement and it rocked the enchanter to his base i followed the thing right up if the king does not arrive i will have myself ridden on a rail if he does i will ride you on a rail instead next day i went up to the telephone office and found that the king had passed through two towns that were on the line i spotted his progress on the succeeding day in the same way i kept these matters to myself the third day's reports showed that if he kept up his gait he would arrive by four in the afternoon there was still no sign anywhere of interest in his coming there seemed to be no preparations making to receive him in state a strange thing truly only one thing could explain this 
that other magician had been cutting under me sure this was true i asked a friend of mine a monk about it and he said yes the magician had tried some further enchantments and found out that the court had concluded to make no journey at all but stay at home think of that observe how much a reputation was worth in such a country these people had seen me do the very showiest bit of magic in history and the only one within their memory that had a positive value and yet here they were ready to take up with an adventurer who could offer no evidence of his powers but his mere unproven word however it was not good politics to let the king come without any fuss and feathers at all so i went down and drummed up a procession of pilgrims and smoked out a batch of hermits and started them out at two o'clock to meet him and that was the sort of state he arrived in the abbot was helpless with rage and humiliation when i brought him out on a balcony and showed him the head of the state marching in and never a monk on hand to offer him welcome and no stir of life or clang of joy bell to glad his spirit he took one look and then flew to rouse out his forces the next minute the bells were dinning furiously and the various buildings were vomiting monks and nuns who went swarming in a rush toward the coming procession and with them went that magician and he was on a rail too by the abbot's order and his reputation was in the mud and mine was in the sky again yes a man can keep his trademark current in such a country but he can't sit around and do it he has got to be on deck and attending to business right along end of chapter twenty four